those working at a hospital in town, I had the opportunity to come in contact with many ghosts. I worked on the geriatric floor, and elderly people died there every day. If the power suddenly went out and immediately came back on, a person had just died. This happened every time. One of the most notable apparitions that I've personally seen was a man with a cane that is seen wandering the halls at night. People admitted to the hospital would often report tapping sounds and seeing an old man's face grinning at them from the hospital door, which all of them had. One lady of about 80 kept telling me that she saw this man's face in the mirror in the bathroom and that half of his face would look badly beaten and disfigured. There have been reports of a cloak man praying over the dead bodies of the recently departed. I can remember one incident where I walked into the morgue and I saw a body that was recently pronounced dead and covered. I could have sworn that I saw the fading presence of this monk kneeling over the body for a few seconds, then disappear. I would feel the air in the room be so cold, but after he vanished, it warmed up. Another popular ghost at the hospital was the Grim Reaper. The Reaper was a dark figure that would come through the window at the end of the hallway. He would shut doors, touch you on the shoulder, etc. Late at night, you could feel that someone was there, and you would see a dark figure out of the corner of your eye. As soon as he looked up, he was gone. My favorite story to tell is this. I was helping a woman get her bath early one morning. I was asking her how she slept, how she felt, etc. She told me that she did not get a wink of sleep because of the man's face she saw in the window. She said that she thought it was tree branches, but she got up in the middle of the night and saw that it was a man's face staring at her through the window. This woman was just in the hospital for a kidney infection. She wasn't on any drugs that would make her hallucinate. On third shift, you could hear children giggling and hear them running up and down the halls, but there are no children on the floor. If you went past the operating room at night, it would be locked, but inside, you could hear instruments clanging and things being thrown around. Haunted church stories seem to be popping up frequently lately, and I'm here to say that I have a brief story that will involve just that. There's this Catholic church that I used to constantly clean. This was in Vermont, and the church had to have been built in the late part of the 19th century. Very beautiful windows looked immaculate. Anyway, I used to work as a janitor cleaning the halls late at night, when I would be the only one there. There were many times when I would hear the organ notes playing repeatedly. I would hear the echoes of human voices speaking together, like whispers, and sometimes even clear words. One night, I was cleaning around the church once again. I was all the way at the end of the church when I heard the organs going off. It wasn't the usual sound either. It sounded monstrous as if someone was literally stomping on the organs. I looked immediately in the direction of where the organ sounds were coming from, and I could have sworn I saw a cloaked figure at the organ and playing it. It was the typical transparent looking apparition, and when it walked even closer to get a better look, the figure had seemed to disappear. That was of course the worst of what I had witnessed but there were times where I would see the organ once again playing by itself. I'd see a note or two being pushed down by itself when nobody else was in the room and it was quiet. Anyway, that's all I have to report. I don't work at this church anymore, I'm happy to say, but I thought it was worth sharing. I wish I could say that this wasn't a real experience, but unfortunately, I can't. At least this will always make for an entertaining read. My name is Shannon. 
I'll be 18 in 11 days. I live in Georgia, and I'm writing to you because I feel so alone. For as long as I can remember, I've dealt with ghosts. I don't know what they are or what they want from me, but they seem to follow me. For the first five years of my life, I lived in a trailer in Mississippi. I can only recall one incident from that because I was so young. I remember it was a beautiful day in spring and I was sitting on a picnic table in our backyard making mud pies when suddenly I heard what I thought to be my mother's voice calling me from the woods. I started to follow it. The closer I got, the further out into the deep woods the voice seemed to go. I almost followed it all the way into the woods, thinking my mother was calling me, but suddenly I heard my mother's real voice calling me from the trailer. I turned and saw her waiting for me next to the picnic table, so I ran back and told her what had happened. She, of course, said that it was my imagination. About 12 years ago, our family moved here to Hiram. Every single night for years, I was terrified to sleep because I saw shadow people. They were like three-dimensional shadows that looked like people. I saw them in my room at night after my parents would put me to bed. When I'd call my parents into the room, they would turn on a light and the shadow people would be gone. They said it was my imagination. Lots of other things have happened and there have been witnesses to some of the events. The house will shake at times. The doors will open and close on their own. I've seen dolls move on their own. A glass has exploded in my hand for no reason. I know glasses will explode from temperature changes, but there was no change in temperature at all. There was a music box that music would play in other rooms of the house when the music box wasn't around. I've heard footsteps when no one was home or awake. I've heard voices. The list goes on. I thought maybe that there was something wrong with me, so I went to a psychiatrist. She said that there's nothing wrong with me. I've learned to verify that I'm really hearing something, because even my cats notice something and hear a lot of things. If they hear it too, their ears perk up. I've tried talking about it before, and they either don't believe me and think I'm making it up, or they think I'm crazy. I really feel alone, and it would be nice if you could get me some sort of guidance. What should I do? Should I do anything? Well, I apologize for the long email. I'm sure that you get a lot of mail every day, and I hate to add to the pile. Thank you for your time. My name is Luann, I'm 19 years old and live in a little redneck town in Virginia. I live with my grandparents and have lived all my life. My mom was 14 and in the 8th grade. My mom had a very best friend named Wendy who was 13. They did everything together. Soon after our house was built, Wendy's parents were not getting along and were going through some separation and divorce procedures. Wendy and her mother had moved to Woodbridge, Virginia, soon. During the time of the separation, Wendy spent a great deal at my mom's newly built house. They spent much of their time in my mom's room, which is now my room. Then came the time for Wendy and her mom to move. It was very early one morning. Wendy was in the back of the van holding a glass coffee table steady. This was in the days before seatbelt laws. There was a drunk driver on the road and hit the van head on. Everyone made it out with semi-serious or minor injuries, but not Wendy. The corner of the glass coffee table hit her in the head and killed her instantly. Years later, in 1985, a week before my mom found out she was pregnant with me, she was in the family room talking to my grandparents about going on birth control. 
My grandmother and my uncle both caught a glimpse of a girl standing behind my mother. And after that two second glimpse, she was gone. My uncle and grandmother agreed that it looked like Wendy. Oh, and she was actually shaking her head when she appeared. We believe that she was shaking her head because she knew my mom was pregnant and didn't want her to go on birth control. Ever since then, everyone in my family has caught a glimpse of her in our house. I usually never get any negative feelings when she materializes, but there was one moment I witnessed her ghost that completely terrified me. I was in the shower, I was home alone, and I had the door completely wide open. It was late evening, and I heard the door to the bathroom slam shut. It startled me so much, so I got dressed and headed out the door. I could have sworn I heard my name being called in a gentle, quiet whisper. It sounded like a little girl. I go downstairs and walk into the living room, and then I see the lights flickering. I also start to hear the sounds of footsteps walking across our hardwood floors. At this point, I thought I had an intruder in the house. I go to call the police, and after I hang up, I rush upstairs to hide in my bedroom. The thing was, as I was running upstairs, I could have sworn I saw the presence of a little girl, in black, in the corner of my eye as I ran for the stairs. It was only for a couple seconds, and of course, my mind was just thinking about hiding from this intruder. I could have just been seeing things, but I swear, I saw a girl for a second. The police showed up, of course, couldn't find anyone and all was quiet. My parents came home, and I told them what happened. They were just happy that I was safe. It wasn't until a few days later that I realized it could have been Wendy. Because my room used to be my mom's room, she's in my room most of the time. I feel her presence there a lot. When I'm upset, no matter where I am in the house, I can feel her there. No one has seen her until my mom became pregnant. My family believes that she was sent to watch over her best friend's daughter. This happened to my cousin and I in Lado too, in a ranch style house my family and I used to live in. My cousin woke up in the middle of the night to my voice or so she thought it was my voice. She looked at me, and I was sound asleep and not talking. Also that night, it was probably four or five in the morning, and I felt someone pecking on my knee, and it wasn't my cousin because she was sound asleep, so I just thought it was my imagination. As we were eating that morning, my cousin had told me what she had heard. I freaked because I knew that whatever had pecked me on my knee was not my imagination. Nothing was ever actually seen in this house, but a lot of things were felt and heard. A few months after that incident, my cousin was staying the night again. Everyone in the house had been asleep for two or three hours, but my cousin, she was so addicted to the game The Sims, and she was still on the computer. As she was shutting down the computer, she heard voices coming from the hallway directly to her right. She looked down there and saw nothing. The voices she heard, she knew were not any of ours, so she ran to the floor where she had made her bed and covered her head up. I guess the voices must have stopped after that. A lot of times I would hear cabinets shut dishes clanked together, and other odd unexplainable noises. One night, my brother got home from a friend's house around 1 or 2 in the morning. I'd been asleep on the couch in the living room for at least 4 hours, and my parents had been asleep in their room for about the same amount of time. As my brother got out of his car, he looked towards the door that went directly into the living room from the outside. 
It had a little window on it. He could see the light from the TV that I always left on at night. But he also saw a black figure looking at him from the inside. He ran in the house and noticed I was on the couch sound asleep. Then he went into my parents' room and asked if they'd been up, and they hadn't. What is scary is that the thing was in the same room with me. The next night, I slept on the couch again. Do not ask me why. My brother was not home yet, and my parents had went to bed. I was watching TV, and I got kind of uneasy, so I laid down and covered up my head. After a while, I heard the glasses in the kitchen sink clanking together. I started to sweat. Then I felt as if someone was coming into the living room, where I was. When my brother arrives home, and the noises stop, I got up and looked at the dishes in the sink, and none of them had been moved. About 14 years ago, we moved into a house that was built in the 1950s. I believe that used to be a boarding house, and was right in front of a cemetery. There were lots of noises heard there, and a few spirits as well. I remember staying home one day, from school, and my mom was asleep because she worked nights, and I heard a voice say my name. It scared me, because we were the only ones home, and it was a voice I had never heard before. My mom would be home during the day by herself, while my brother and I were at school, and she would hear a music box playing. At the time, we had music boxes, but they did not play the song she heard. My mom would be sleeping on the couch, and she would hear footsteps coming through the kitchen, which was right next to the living room where she was. One time, when that happened, she grabbed her shoes and didn't come back till we got out of school. She also would be sleeping in her bed, and it would start shaking. This also happened to me. The shed in this house was directly behind my parents' bedroom because their bedroom used to be a garage. Well, anyway, my mom would be lying on her bed, and she would hear someone or something walking in there. The odd thing was, it sounded like boots on wood, but the floor in there was concrete. We had a little dog out there at the time, but there was no way it could have sounded like that when it walked. One night, my mom, dad, and brother we were all sleeping in my room because we put the air conditioner in there in the summer. Well, anyway, it was a cool night, so they had turned the air off and left the door open. My mom, for some reason, looked at the doorway and felt as if there was a presence there. She just put her face into my dad's back and went to sleep. The next day, she found out that her beloved dad had died, who lived in Kansas, and hadn't been found for a few days. She believes that it was him in the doorway. My brother saw a ghostly head in his bathroom one night. It was in a mist. It was bald on top, with hair around the edges of his head. We believe it was my great-grandpa. This happened at my grandma's house on September 2nd, 2004. It was my grandma's birthday and my mom, my little cousin and I, went there to have cake and ice cream. Well, my little cousin decides she wants a Miracle Whip sandwich. She pressed up against the door frame, asking my grandma if she could have a sandwich, when all of a sudden, she looked towards the microwave in the kitchen and screams, drops the jar, and runs to the couch where my grandma is and my little was crying hysterically. We were all like, what just happened? For some reason, I became very cold and got goosebumps and had the urge to sit up. My little cousin wouldn't tell us what she saw. My grandma tried to tell us it was a mouse or a buck, but I highly doubt it because she wouldn't have acted like she did. My grandma believes in ghosts, but I think she said that to make herself feel better because she knew she was going to be there alone when we left. 
My little cousin, I believe, has forgotten about the incident, so I did not know what happened. Other things have happened at the grandma's, like something kicked her bed very hardly one night, and she also seen the spirit of a young girl, dressed in white one day, while lying on her couch in her living room. She's seen a shadow-like figure outside her window, which she knows wasn't a human, because her cat started hissing and acting weird, and there's probably been other things that happened that I do not know about. I don't believe I've actually ever seen a spirit, but I know I felt them, because in certain places, or sometimes when I talk about the spirits, the back of my neck starts to hurt and feels weird, and sometimes, my head will start hurting. I have so many stories to share with you, but I will send them at a later time. My cousin and I were out in Glenpool, towards the boondocks where my grandparents used to live, watching TV late at night. We weren't really tired, hyped up on caffeine from Pepsi and Sprite, just hanging out and trying to see how long we could go without passing out to sleep. At first, I thought I was just hearing things, or my cousin thought I was being a jerk and screwing around. But the louder the sound got, and closer, that's when we both turned the volume down. We then went to turn to each other and ask the same question. Was that you? Did you hear that? Of course. It was like a scratching, shuffling sound outside, and we both dismissed it, thinking that perhaps it was the family pets or wild animal, since the house was out in the middle of nowhere. Instead, curiosity got the better of us. I suggested that maybe it was a ghost, and she promptly crawled towards the window for a peek. She didn't say anything, standing still, like if she moved something would see her. I started to talk, but she silenced me with the wave of her hand. When I got over to the glass, I stared off into the black yard, expecting to see a deer or something. Instead, what I saw was a thing, best word used to describe it. It was all black, nearly invisible in the shadows it clung to. The only way we were able to see it all was due to a distant light pole. It was skirting around. I guess the dogs must have felt the tension in the air, because at that moment, they all went into wild barks at this intruder. It swung its head, or what seemed like a head, towards the sound of the barks, then up to the window we both watched it from. There was nothing there, no face, nothing at all. Needless to say, both of us were terrified to see a hooded, faceless figure staring back at us. It disappeared, melting into the shadows. The dogs yipped, dashing for cover. Both me and my cousin were cold, shocked, afraid, and speechless. We don't know what it was looking for in our yard, or what it was at all. I used to believe it was a person thinking of robbing our house, or at least, I tell myself that, so I don't get freaked. Though the truth seems a lot creepier, it is still the truth, and neither I nor my cousin can deny that. When I was 11 years old, at about 3 o'clock in the morning, I woke up to hear the sound of my dad plowing our driveway. He soon left for work, and I couldn't fall back asleep. After all was quiet, I got out of my bunk bed and climbed down my stairs and walked into the hallway. I went to the bathroom and then back to my room. I climbed into bed and crawled over towards my pillow. It was then that I turned around and was about to pull my blankets over me when I noticed two bright green lights in the corner of my room directly in front of me. They were glowing and hovering in the same spot I just walked through. I was confused and tried to think of all the possible things they could be, 
Smoke alarm light? Glow-in-the-dark plastic stars? Anything? I started to get more scared as the time passed, because I tried to eliminate the fact that it could be a spirit. I tried to figure out if it was my eyes playing tricks on me. Perhaps I saw the lights from a clock, and my eyes just needed to adjust to the darkness. I didn't turn any lights on while I got up. I blinked my eyes in a different spot on my wall, and tried to see if the lights would follow my eyes. They didn't. At this point, I looked back to the spot and there they were. I was so scared. They were eyes, and they were staring at me. I was terrified. I couldn't move at all. I was laying down resting on my elbows, just staring at them. They moved forward a foot or so, very slowly. Then, they moved back, and just as slowly, vanished to left through my wall. I was so scared they would come back. And that's the end of the story. Riverdale Road has a lot more than just that certain place by 132nd. Riverdale Road is spooky throughout the entire road. It's weird. Sometimes the road stretches and shrinks. The bad side of the road actually starts on 104th, North Glen, and goes all the way to the end of the Highway 7, Boulder. But anyway, from 104th to Highway 7, is approximately 13 to 15 miles. I was paying attention to the mileage, and I was going about 35 to 40 the entire time. I started at 104th, and by the time I got to Highway 7, I had only gone 9 miles when I turned around to go back the other way towards 104th again. When I got there, I went 16 miles. Now tell me that isn't creepy. If you pay real close attention to the road, you could almost see it stretching. There's also this turn called Dead Man's Curve. It's a real sharp turn. The recommended speed is 25, but easily done at 40. There's a cement block wall bordering one side of the turn. If you turn that corner around 2.30 a.m., you will see a woman in the middle of the road, holding her hands up, waving for you to stop. When I went around that corner, I didn't have time to stop because she's right there after you do a half 90 degree turn. I ended up hitting her. I got out of my car and looked all around. Absolutely no one was around, but there were handprints on the hood of the car. Also, if you turn onto Riverdale from 112th and turn left, there will be a huge line of trees on the either side and it just looks like a dark cave of trees, and there's a very mean jogger spirit that hitchhikes and jogs around there. My sister and I were driving around on that road and went through that little cave of trees, and she said she first got a glimpse of the light on his shoes on the left side, going away from 104th, and as you get closer, you can see that it's a person, and he was holding out his hands for hitchhiking. Then, all of a sudden knelt down in the running position, and as soon as we got close enough, he jetted out in front of us. My sister said that there were bodily fluids and body parts all over on the windshield, and she blinked, and it was all gone. She said as soon as he knelt down getting ready to run, she saw that his face was just a skull, and his hand was bones. So yeah... It's not just that spot right by 132nd. There are millions of ghosts and spirit stories for that road, believe me. I've gone up and down that road billions of times. I used to do it about five to seven times a day for about a year, so I know that road pretty well. I moved to Overland Park, Kansas, during my sixth grade year, along with my brother, stepfather, and brother, the five-story house we lived in was in a new neighborhood, and I never took the time to research the land on which our neighborhood was built. 
Of course, I didn't know what experiences I would find myself in throughout the next few years. My night's routine consisted mostly of sitting in the sunroom on the fourth floor that looked towards the hallway leading to the two bedrooms, a bathroom, a linen closet, and the staircase which led to the master bedroom while reading whatever book I had at hand. I can't recall how long it had been since my family and I moved into the house. However, I remember this night clearly. My parents went out to eat, and I stayed behind, at home. I was curled into the corner of a sofa that sat in front of a set of windows, reading Guardian by John Saul. The first incident happened well after the night sky had darkened. I was concentrating heavily on my book, when I began to hear a knocking coming from outside. It sounded almost exactly like someone hammering on the side of the house. Looking up for my book, I turned and looked outside to see who could be outside at such a time. However, I couldn't see anyone, so I turned around and made myself comfortable to engross myself in my book. Again, the banging continued and the most effort I put into looking out the window again was angling my head and looking out of the corner of my eye. After a few minutes, the sound outside stopped, only to begin inside. This time, it sounded as someone was banging a hammer on the pipe in the basement, three floors below. The banging was four or five short clangs, and then silence. I'd raise my book again, until I was interrupted by another round of clangs. The only thing I can do was try my best to ignore it. As I continued to read, I experienced this unnerving feeling of being watched. I tried to reposition myself on the couch, shifting my legs from underneath me and stretching out, but nothing would unshake their presence. I finally set it on propping my feet on the table and resting the book on my knees. It was then where I could see in my peripheral vision a man standing on the top step of the staircase leading to my parents' bedroom. He stood in complete black, perfectly still, and watched. When I looked directly at him, he disappeared. I figured all the noises in the man I saw were a result of reading the book, and because of this conclusion, I refused to look up at the staircase again, regardless of the fact that the man was still there. I never spoke of the clanging of the man once my parents came home, because I figured it was my imagination. My parents were arguing when they came home anyway, so I tried my best not to get in their way. Most of my time was spent in my room, when there were others in the house. You could blame it on adolescents and wanting to be by myself. It was there in my room where another strange incident occurred. I had my radio cranked to the highest decibel and was rocking out when I heard a knock on my door. Turning down the radio, I rushed to the door and opened it to find no one standing outside. I shrugged, thinking I was hearing noises due to the loud radio. Closed the door and cranked the radio back up again. A few minutes later, I heard the knocking again, but this time, instead of turning down the radio, I opened the door while the radio blared. Again, no one stood at my door. I walked into the bathroom, which was immediately to my right, and checked behind the drawn shower curtain, because my mother would love to hide and jump out behind me as I walked down the hallway. Well, she wasn't going to get me this time, only she wasn't behind the curtain. I walked down the entire hallway, checking the kitchen and bedrooms, before going to my parents' bedroom. It, too, was empty, so I hightailed it to my bedroom, shut the door, and sat on my bed. I figured whoever wanted to come in would, so I no longer answered the knocks. Whoever it was, not twice more, and then stopped. Months passed, 
and the knockings continued, and the man stood on the top step of the staircase. After a while, I became so used to it, but I never mentioned it to anyone in my house. I always figured it was my mind playing tricks on me. Eventually, the sounds and the man disappeared, and I never experienced them again until years later. My mother and I were standing on the back porch one night while she smoked a cigarette. No one was allowed to smoke inside because my younger brother was asthmatic. While she smoked, she mentioned, I see people in this house. I casually looked at her and replied, You too? I can't remember the look on her face, but the sound of her voice distinguished her fear. She told me that she continuously saw three people standing on the staircase leading to her bedroom. Only the people she saw were dressed in white. She said that the people she saw stood on the stairs day and night, whereas the person I saw was dressed in black and only stood at the top of the stairs at night. She told me of a night when she was smoking in the garage and she heard a knocking on the door. Figuring it was her husband, she knocked back in return. Moments later, another knock, and she returned it, and again, and again, until the door opened, and her husband asked why she was knocking on the door. Her answer was, because you were knocking. He informed her that he had been downstairs watching television. A year or so after I shared our experiences, my mother and brother, and me, of course, moved out of the house and into an apartment across the street from the neighborhood. My mother and her husband were separated, but he continuously stayed at our apartment anyway. One night, my mother decided to drive back to the house to feed our dog that we left behind at the house while my stepfather was inside our apartment sleeping. I remained behind as well, sitting outside in the back patio. My mother was gone for 10 or 15 minutes before rushing back through the front door. The hairs on her arm were standing on edge, and she couldn't seem to collect her thoughts. She finally asked, Do you think I'm crazy? I laughed and asked why. She explained, While the dog was eating out in the garage, she had gone inside to close the blinds in the formal living room. While her back was the rest of the room, she heard a distant voice saying, Get out of the house. She said she shook it off and walked up to the sunroom to close more blinds, where she again heard, Get out of the house. Finally, while closing the blinds in the kitchen, she said that the voice was so close that she ran out of the house without closing the remaining blinds, jerked the dog into the garage, and sped back to the apartment. A year later, we moved to Georgia, where there have been no experiences in any of the houses we've resided in. I've been debating with myself as to why she and I would see people standing on the same staircase, and if their different clothing represented anything. Maybe because that's where most of my parents' fights would take place or what was trying to get our attention by knocking on the walls. What I do know is that now, now that my mother is no longer married to the same man, we haven't experienced anything of the like since. When I was nine years old, we moved to a house in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. My mom had just gotten remarried, so I now had a stepfather whom I absolutely despised. About a year or so later, my dad started renovations on the house. We added almost half a house on. There was a three season porch, a mudroom, a bathroom, and two basement bedrooms. My sister moved out of her bedroom to the new one in the basement. A few days later, I was in my bed. My bed faced the wall by the door but I couldn't look out down the hall. I had only been in bed for a few minutes. I looked up 
because it felt as someone was in the room with me. That's when I thought there was my stepfather standing at the foot of my bed. He was wearing what appeared to be a hooded trench coat and appeared as a dark silhouette. Looking back, it didn't really initially terrify me because I just thought it was my stepfather playing tricks on me as I said. Boy, was I terrified. I yelled, Ken, get out of here. Suddenly, my mom, who was in her bed at the end of the hall, yelled back at me that he was asleep in the bed next to her. Suddenly, the figure disappeared. I ran as fast as possible into our bedroom. There was my stepdad, sound asleep and snoring right next to her. I told her what I saw, and she just told me to go back to bed. The next morning, at the breakfast table, I started telling everyone. My oldest brother described the man in the hood. He also said he seen the man in his bedroom at the foot of his bed. His bedroom was in the basement, located right under my parents' room. He also thought it was our stepdad, until it vanished. He just thought he was hallucinating or something, and didn't tell anyone. Honestly, now, I really wish it was my dad. Hi, I'm a 21-year-old student in Chicago, Illinois. I'd like to tell you my story, and if possible, ask for your professional opinion about a few things. I've experienced spiritual and ghostly activity for about 11 years now. I used to be frightened by these experiences, but now I'm quite intrigued. However, one incident stands out in my mind and still bothers me to this day. This is the story that I would like to tell you about. About five years ago, I lived in an apartment on the second floor. It was an unusually warm summer's night, so I decided to sleep on the couch with the sliding door open to let in the breeze. I awoke at about 2.30 a.m. to a horrid stench and a strange coolness. Confused, I looked around the living room. I looked then, and directly in front of myself, and I was lying on my right side with my right arm tucked under my head as a pillow, and I saw a figure. I was frozen with fright as my eyes began to adjust to the darkness, and I saw the figure's face. At this point, I was thinking that someone broke into the apartment. However. This was no person. This ghost had a human shaped face, but it was a grayish white color. Its eyes were darkened, and what I remember the most was the huge prominent cheekbones. Furthermore, this thing only had a torso and a head, nothing else. Suddenly, with great quickness, its head descended, positioned its face directly in front of mine stared at me for a moment, and as quickly as it descended, it pulled its head back to the original position. I began crying at this moment, and that's when I felt a sort of punch on my chest. It then seemed to kind of run off into the kitchen, and then I heard the door slam. I jumped from off the couch, turned the lights on, and checked the door out. The door was locked from the inside so there was no possible way that someone had broken into the apartment and left through the kitchen door. To say the least, I was badly shaken. I took a moment to collect myself. When I realized my chest hurt, I went to the bathroom and pulled down my pajama top slightly, which revealed a large red mark as if someone had punched me. This mark eventually developed into slight bruising as the morning came. Needless to say, I didn't sleep that night. Since this event, several other experiences have occurred, none as frightening as this, thank goodness. However, a cluster of events did occur directly after this experience. For what reason, I'm not sure. I did go to the library and search for possible causes for such an occurrence. The closest I got to a logical answer 
was something called a night terror, which I'm sure you are familiar with. But I've excluded this as a possible explanation for many reasons. The only thing I can think of is that I had seen a ghostly entity as to why there was a stench or a cold chill associated with the experience, I can only guess. Also, I've always been under the impression that spirits cannot harm the living, but I simply cannot believe this to be true anymore. And this is an experience that I had when I was younger. It's a little short, and remains my creepiest ghost story I've ever had. I had to have been 8 or 9 years old when it happened, and yes, it sounds a little corny, but it was truly an unforgettable and authentic experience. It happened to be dark and dreary on this night. It had been raining really hard, and I had no choice but to walk through the rain. The rain just kept pouring down, and all I could think about was how miserable I was from the rain, and just wanted to get to my friend's house faster. I think it was around 10 p.m., and I was walking through the neighborhood park to my friend's house on the other side, when all of a sudden, I saw my dead grandmother appear from out of nowhere. Oddly enough, it was a year to the day of her death from cancer. She just looked as she did before she got sick, though. She looked wonderful. Of course, I wasn't sure if it was really her, so I walked up to her and called out her name. The wind became harsher, and the rain fell harder, and as she reached out to me, I could see she was in pain. It was at that very moment that her face changed, and she became scared, and looked as though she needed my help, and it was then that she disappeared. I had to have been three to five feet away. Needless to say, I ran as fast as I could to my friend's house, and didn't say another word that very night. I was sent to live with my grandparents when I was three years old. I loved my grandpa with all my heart, and he and I became very close because he could not work due to a serious heart condition. We took wonderful care of each other. Even at the age of five, I've always been very responsible due to my grandfather's ill health. One day, when I was nine, my grandma kept me home from school to look after grandpa because he was not feeling well. About 9.30 that morning, he went to lay down because he said he did not feel well. I went in about 10.30 to take his temperature and discover his fever to be 103.4. I rushed and called my grandma and mother immediately. In turn, my mother said she was going to call an ambulance so I was to get grandpa ready and wait for them. As I did this, my grandpa called me into his room and told me, Pumpkin, I love you very much and you know this. Even though you are young and in time will forget different things about me, just always remember my love and the way you feel. I promise you this, I'll always be there with you and you'll always be in my heart. I will always remember him saying this because that was the last conversation he ever had. I never got to say goodbye because he fell into a deep coma and they wouldn't allow me into ICU to say goodbye. He then died on May 26, 1983 at 5.36am. I know this for a fact because he had given me his watch to hold on to while he was in the hospital and it stopped at that very second that they pronounced his death. Now, while that is odd enough, the best part is yet to come. Three weeks after my grandpa had passed away, my grandmother became very ill and was put into the hospital. So my sister, brother-in-law and myself stayed out at my grandma's house. My sister had a cat that whenever someone came down the stairs, it would run to the basement door and cling to the screen to be let out. While one night, at about 11.30 p.m., the cat was sleeping with me on the couch in the basement when it jumped down and ran to the door to cling onto the screen when all of a sudden we heard footsteps. Now the house is locked, my grandmother is in the hospital, and we are all in bed downstairs. 
My brother-in-law grabs his baseball bat and tells us to call 911. At first I was very scared and was crying. And then they went upstairs. The footsteps stopped. And all of a sudden, my grandpa was standing in front of me, holding the note I had put in his pocket the day of the funeral. He had a tear in his eye and told me not audibly, but I could see his lips move, that he loved me and would always be there with me. Ever since then, any major life event, graduation, marriage, the birth of my two children, anything, I felt this love at one time or another, and have felt a huge sense of calmness. I guess this would be a second account of a previously encountered ghost story. I had the same thing happen to me as in the story below on Denton Road, Ypsilanti, Denton Road Bridge. The story goes that a group of kids were playing chicken near Denton Road Bridge and one of them proved to be chicken. His car swerved off the road when they reached the bridge and they crashed into the river below. Many people claim to see a light come out of the river and chase their vehicle to the end of the road if they stop at the center of the bridge at night. I'm a racer and have a very fast, very built up 1969 Dodge. One stopped on this bridge simply because we were lost and a pair of headlights came up the embankment and behind me and started coming up on me very fast. I thought some drunken redneck was out four-wheeling was going to rear end me. The car was in gear and running, so I simply stepped on the gas and the headlights behind me pulled up within a few feet of my rear bumper. I floored it and the lights stayed right on my bumper. Couldn't see a thing behind me because the brights were on the car following me and they were far brighter than any car I'd ever seen. I had the speedometer buried past 120 miles per hour and they were two feet off my bumper. I remember the red glare of the brake lights lighting up the road behind me some, and the moon was very bright that night, so I could see the way to the bridge practically, and there was not a car on the road. I was a little stunned, and almost lost the car at the turn. We went back to make sure that no one behind us had got into the ditch, when there was nothing. And then I got freaked, and made it back to Windsor in record time. I don't know how to start this, other than saying several years ago, when my children were small, we moved down to the country on the Washington side and lived in a home that I feel has some strange paranormal or ghostly things going on in it. I would have to say that during that time, there was something in there causing all havoc in our home. To make it short, I used to on a regular basis have something come to me, and I'm not sure what, but let me explain what it looked like. I would wake up from asleep most of the time, but sometimes I was fully awake in bed when it would happen, but for the most part, I would wake up from a sound sleep and notice this lavender colored smoke, or whatever you want to call it, coming from the corner where my closet was, and it would do different things at different times. It would wrap around my perimeter of my room, and then go to the end of my bed, and separate into five different lines, and then dart at me and then would go away. Sometimes it would wrap around the room and then come down from above into five different lines. The first few times that this happened to me, I was very frightened and would wake my husband up. And of course, by the time I could wake him up, there was nothing there. He slept very hard. This went on for a whole seven years that we lived in this home. During that time, my husband also became very mean and violent. Also, in the room adjoining where my closet and my son's closet connect, my son was having these horrific nightmares that we could not wake him up from. We would sit there for sometimes 20 to 30 minutes, trying to wake him up, and he would be begging for his mother or his father, and crying out, asking them to go away and leave him alone. He would describe them as ugly and short, very ugly and mean looking in the face, and they would torment him and scare him and try to hurt him. 
This was heart-wrenching for me to see him go through this and not be able to wake him up. I would cry right alongside of him when I was holding him, rocking him, trying to wake him up from these nightmares. All of my children used to tell me that in the house, they would see a ball of light sometimes that would move quickly through the home. I saw that occasionally as well. Our television was something quite interesting as well. It would turn off by itself while we were watching it, and then it would turn back on with the remote, and then it would turn back off again. We could play this game for a few minutes, and then it would stop. This only happened a couple of times through the TV. I do feel that there was something evil in that home, because many things went on in that home. What the lavender colored smoke was, or the ball of light, or even my son's terrifying dreams were, I have no clue. I don't have a great deal about that kind of stuff. I do feel that I have many experiences though, and had some in other homes as well. Who knows, maybe they follow me, but the home in Washington was not a good ghost, if that is what it was. Her family went through some of our hardest times in that home. Can you tell me what the lavender smoke was, or what the ball of light was? I would be very interested in knowing. You could respond to me. Thanks so much. I'm from the Southern California area, so here's how it goes. I was born in the Los Angeles area, but my parents bought a brand new home in the Orange County area. The city of La Palma, to be exact. The house was located on some ranch of some sort because our backyard faced a very large open but fenced field with some cattle roaming around in it. Mind you, these are track homes as we know it today, and at the time, it seemed like we were living in the boondocks. I mean, looking back at it now, it was a rather very lonely area, but it all had these new track homes. You know, one supermarket, one library, one hospital, fire station, and police station. You get the idea, what well, the funny thing was, we were only four blocks west of Knott's Berry Farm. That is, if you stand at the main entrance, as you get closer to the park. Anyway, the house was well built, new carpet, plumbing, the whole works with upgrades. But on some occasions, I was very scared downstairs in the family room. I was even scared in my own bedroom. I mean, my room looked like a toy room display so there was no reason for me to get scared just out of the blue. I mean, I was playing in my room, and it seemed as if evil walked in the room. I got this incredible feeling of hate towards me, as if I shouldn't have been there. It has happened to me several times in the house, and at seven years of age, I didn't know anything about the supernatural or paranormal activity. Another occasion was during a Saturday afternoon. My mother and I were upstairs, and suddenly, we heard this slamming and crashing noise, and as we came down the stairs, we saw in the living room, my mom's favorite painting, smashed on the floor. It looked as if someone broke it in anger. I mean, the frame was just trashed, and the small pictures around the one that got smashed were perfectly hanging straight. The ghost made itself seen again in the late afternoon. This time, my mom was doing some house cleaning, and as she turned to one side, she looked up towards the stairs, and she saw a man wearing a white cream colored suit in pristine condition, except he didn't have a head. No Hollywood genre or anything like that. I saw the same thing myself. This time, I saw him at night, at the end of the hallway. This was very real, and very scary. Another time, as I would sleep at night, the beds were occasionally kicked very hard. Also in the master bedroom, the sliding glass mirror doors were slamming back and forth, and the dresser drawers were also slamming in and out as well. All these things would happen separately from each other on different occasions. The main boulevard is La Palma Avenue, and the street of the house is Comstock Circle. We lived there from 1970 to 1975. My parents and I, and that is the most scary and terrifying ghost story I have. Thanks for listening.
I don't normally tell these stories to anyone because they sound outlandish, but I'm a professional as an NBA in English, and I've had some of the strangest things happen to me. The most memorable one was in the fall of 1990. I was a senior in high school, and my boyfriend and I were out with our best friend. Being a stupid teenager, I was riding on my boyfriend's lap in the front seat because we were just going to the park, which was only about three miles from where we were, and we lived in the middle of no man's land. There was a forest of trees in the middle of the fork. We were talking and carrying on, and my friend, Mike, took the left fork instead of the right fork. I looked up, fussing at him for taking the wrong road, when we saw this guy in a gray sweatshirt and blue sweatpants walk out of the trees right in front of the car. Of course, I thought we were going to wreck, so I braced my arm on the dashboard and ducked my head, preparing to be thrown through the windshield. I was screaming, but I felt no impact. When I looked up, we were on the right road going towards the park, and there was no one in front of the car. Of course, we stopped the car and mulled around for a few minutes, trying to see if maybe someone had wrecked in the trees, but there was no sign of anything. I do know that about four years before that, my brother had a good friend who died at the intersection while running from the cops after domestic dispute. He never made the turn and went straight into the trees. He left behind two small children. Maybe it was him trying to go home. My next experience happened with a Ouija board, and I can promise I'll never touch another one. We were trying to contact a friend who had passed away about a year earlier. I asked him to prove he was who he said, and he gave us some details that each of us in the room would know about him individually, but not collectively. I asked him to prove he was there. I heard something happening in the laundry room, and I threw the board into the hallway and went to look. All the cabinets above the washer and dryer were open, and all the storage sheets were laying all over the floor. My cat's food and water had been pushed to the opposite side of the room. It was too scary for all of us. We camped out together in sleeping bags on the floor, as close to one another as we could. And this is my final story, because this one is happening presently. I had a daughter two years ago. I decided to pass on my middle name, which has been a family tradition for girls in our family for years, Grace. The wild thing is, my daughter was due on June 21st, which I thought was cool because it was my brother's birthday, but she was born on May 27th, 1996, exactly one year to the date of the death of my Aunt Grace, whom I loved during life. She was my godmother, and she never had any kids, and I felt it was a meaningful tribute to her. Anyways, getting to my point, my daughter was born very sick, but became healthy very quickly. She has grown into a radiant little girl. We have moved five times since she was born, my job and me traveling, and we finally decided to settle near one set of my grandparents, so she could have the loving support I never had, so we moved to Atlanta. The strange thing is, I've noticed that she always has the coldest room in the house. My husband makes a joke out of it, since he is always hot, that he doesn't know how we always do that. I believe it is my Aunt Grace watching over her, her guardian angel. I've been in her room, putting her to bed, reading her a story, and felt someone sit on the bed with us with a great thud. My aunt was no little woman, but always a beautiful one. The strangest thing that has happened recently is that an old makeup case with a camel on it, with the powder still in it, has appeared in my home. I know I did not get this from my mom because we do not speak. It sits in my bookcase. When my husband and I married, I decided to use her wedding band, but it causes blisters on my fingers and always appears in the jewelry box that I keep in my daughter's room. 
So now I know. My Aunt Grace wants my daughter to have it, instead of me. I've always wondered what was going on in the house I grew up in. It was only 20 years old when we bought it. We knew the builders. It had only one owner since then. An old woman who kept cats. My mother bought the house when I was four. And from day one, I was terrified to be in there. It just felt wrong. It was a small house, only two bedrooms, all on one level, with the exception of an attic and a basement. There were definitely sections of the house that felt safe, and sections that did not. The back bedroom, the back bedroom closet, the bathroom, and the short steps and hallway leading to the back door and basement were not. The first bedroom, living room, and ironically enough, the kitchen, so as long as you put your eye on that back hall, were safe. The things that occurred in the house were experienced by the entire family, though my mother and older sister always had a reasonable explanation for them. Heavy breathing could often be heard. Mom's explanation, the swing set up the road creaking, Footsteps across the ceiling, the neighbors. Now, our house sat alone and shared no walls. So how would we hear the neighbors going up their stairs, inside their house? Items that were set down would suddenly vanish, only to reappear after much frantic hunting. But worse than that was the feel. People were loath to do anything that would make a loud noise, vacuuming, showering, flushing the toilet, frying food, anything that made a cover-up noise. It always made you want to spin around and run when you couldn't hear past the noise you were making, as if for allowing something to sneak up on you. When anyone went down to the basement, which housed the washer and dryer, they inevitably ran down the stairs. Those stairs, you just didn't want to be caught on them. My mom was a compulsive decorator, and the only spot in the house that did not boast ornamentation was the hall leading to the basement stairs. Even she couldn't bear to be in there long enough to hang a picture. Once in the basement, the person felt compelled to keep a running, shouted conversation with whomever was upstairs. You did not want to be cut off down there. Sleeping in this house was a nightmare. The overwhelming fear of shutting off the light and daring to sleep. Myself and my niece both experienced this. In the back bedroom, too, there was a closet. The closet door had a tendency to suddenly slam open. My mom's explanation, it was hung crooked. When I was 14, tired of it, I put a latch on it. Some years later, the door flung itself open hard enough to send a latch flying through the opposite window. Hung crooked indeed. The most terrifying event in the house was experienced by myself, my niece, and my dog. We were sleeping, both in my room. My sister was asleep on the sofa, and my mom in her room. Jennifer and I were awakened by a voice from the area of the basement calling my name. I thought it was my sister, and asked her what she wanted. I woke her up. It had not been her. I woke my mom up. It wasn't her either. While I was talking to my mother, the voice came again, telling me to come to it. My niece asked my mom if she had heard it, and my mother replied that she had heard nothing, and that we were dreaming, both of us, dreaming the same dream. Okay. It went on all night. And my dog, guardian of my well-being, hid under the bed and whimpered. We lived in the house for 17 years. During that time, we had bedding switched from one bed to another. Tapes and records moved under furniture. And perhaps the most puzzling, we came home daily for a week to find bowls of hot food and cups of steaming tea set out as though someone had just been there, yet the house was locked. We had a neighbor watch the house to make sure the kids weren't coming in. 
but nobody was seen to enter. To this day, whenever my niece or myself have a nightmare, it is set in that house. No dreams that take place in the house turn out to be good ones. I've actually had dreams that were going along fine, until I realized where I was. I also remember having a dream that I was married, and my husband had purchased a house. He took me to see our new house, and you guessed it, it was for Harrison Court. In the dream, the most amazing wave of terror swept over me at the thought of stepping into the house again. We have no idea what was wrong with it. We know the woman who bought it from us, and she still lives in it. My children and I had a very bad experience with a demon in a house that we lived in. My son became very scared one night as he viewed the ghost of a man with a sword sticking out of its side. This ghost was standing in the doorway of my son's bedroom very late one night. He said that this thing was just giving him the feeling of such terrible hatred and dread. It made my son feel like it was going to kill us. My son started sleeping in my daughter's bedroom, and that thing started going from room to room, looking for my son, and so it started coming into our room and scaring the daylights out of me. I had felt the hatred and anger. I know that it would have killed us if we had not gotten our pastor out there. When our pastor pulled into our drive, he said he felt the anger and hatred just emanating from the house to the outside. He knew what we were up against, and we immediately started saying prayers and his army of saints to fight for us. Ultimately, it worked. So while we were living there, we had no more problems. But whenever we drive by, we cannot even look at the house. Reading some of the stories that your readers have sent you, brought back a memory I thought I had long forgotten, and I would like to share it with you. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, it did not occur to me, but instead happened to a childhood friend of mine. Being an ex-army brat, part of my childhood was spent in a suburb just east of St. Louis called Spanish Lake. It was called that for a lake that was near there in a favorite hangout of many of the townspeople. A nice lake during the day, but at night, it was said that the ghost of a sunken Spanish galleon walked the shores of the lake, especially during the summer months, in search of what was unknown. At one time, I had been told that several people had simply disappeared from there and were never heard from again. Truth or not, I will not venture a guess. The lake was also said to have a section that was bottomless, and there, supposedly, lay the Spanish galleon. Being teenagers and fearing nothing, several of us used to go there with our girlfriends or boyfriends and park. But one night, my friend told me he had learned his lesson and would never, ever go there again. I came out of my house one summer's day in 1971 and I saw Randy up the street, absolutely throwing a fit, yelling, screaming, cursing, and in general, having the proverbial cow. He was standing near his car, a 1966 Plymouth Roadrunner, in mint condition, or at least, it almost was, now. Something you must understand is that this car was Randy's pride and joy. He babied the car, and it was one of the fastest car in the area at the time, as well as one of the sharpest looking cars. It was a painted metallic turquoise and built to the hilt. I asked him what he was so pissed off about, and he showed me. What I saw scared the bejesus out of me. It looked as if someone or something had ran their fingers down the entire length of the passenger side of his car and completely melted the paint where they had touched the car. He told me that he and his girlfriend, the night before, had gone to their favorite spot on the lake to be alone. He told me that they had been there long enough to fog the windows a little, 
during a pause for breath catching or something, one of them looked out the front window, seeing what appeared to be a sort of red glow emanating from the lake itself. At first they tried to ignore it, their attention on each other, but unfortunately, they both became rather interested in it. Randy told me that within the glow, he started to make out what looked like a ball, just a little brighter than the glow itself. At this point, Randy told me that it appeared to start coming towards them. He told me that it looked like it was pulsing or something, almost as though it were alive. It came slowly towards them, and they got really scared. His girlfriend told him that she wanted to leave, right now. Randy told me that he tried to start the car, and absolutely nothing happened. Not one damn thing. It was almost as if all the power had been sucked from it. Meantime, the red glow continued towards them. He said his girlfriend became near hysterical, wanting to leave, but he told her that, try as he might, there was nothing he could do, and he was not about to get out of the car to find out either. All they could do was make sure the doors were locked, and the windows were up as far as they would go, and wait. He said that after a short time, the red glow completely surrounded them, and his car began a slow rocking motion. At first, then, without warning, Randy told me that the car began to rock more violently, and he said he and his girlfriend could hear a growling or something of the sort anyway. Then he told me that he could hear a scraping sound down the passenger side of his car. He said the best way he could describe the sound was like someone scraping their fingernails down a chalkboard. Randy said this went on for several more minutes. He wasn't sure for how long. And all he and his girlfriend could do was sit there and hold one another. She, of course, in tears, and Randy very nearly there himself. Suddenly, he said, the growling stopped, the scraping ceased, and the glow was gone. It simply wasn't there anymore. Shaking, he reached for the ignition switch and tried turning the key. He said the car started right away, and they got the heck out of there, not looking back once, and were grateful when they were back up on the main road and heading into town. By the time Randy had been able to calm his girlfriend down and get her home, it was very late, so he decided to just go home and try to get some sleep, but not before trying to see what kind of damage had been done. Randy told me that after he had gotten home, he went into the house, got his flashlight, and went back outside. He said that at the time, he saw absolutely nothing, and after very careful examination too. But the next morning, his brother had wakened him, wanting to know what happened to his baby. That's when he discovered what he had. He tried several times after to fix the problem, but within a few days, the fingerprints would reappear, just as if they were fresh. Shortly after that, I left Spanish Lake. I was told that Randy eventually got rid of his car, and I heard nothing more of it. But to be honest with you, I've not been too awfully curious either. When I was about 13 years old, I used to babysit quite a lot in my neighborhood. Back then, I didn't believe in ghosts or the paranormal. I lived in upstate New Jersey at the time. My foster family had recently moved into a new housing development in a small suburban town near the New York State border. The house next door to us was an old farmhouse. The housing development had been built on what had been the farm. The farmhouse had supposedly been built during the mid to late 1700s. When I came home from a babysitting job late one night, I looked out at the window for several minutes at the stars, trying to find the different constellations, as was my habit just about every night. Then, I saw a ball of mist, which appeared to be walking down the middle of the road. I thought that it must be some kind of gas or water vapor, 
although I'd never seen anything like it in my life. It seemed so deliberate. It never veered from the road. I watched it go to the end of the block and make a right into the woods that led to New York State. It was weird, but I figured that there must be some rational explanation for it. The couple who had just moved into the old farmhouse needed a babysitter for a Saturday night for their four-year-old daughter. I agreed to babysit. I arrived at the couple's house about 7 p.m. on a hot summer night. As soon as I entered their house, their Doberman Pinscher ran up to me and started barking at me and howling. He wouldn't stop regardless of what the couple tried to do. His howls became shrill and he began to growl at me. I'd never been afraid of animals, as I'd grown up around dogs and I like animals very much. This dog really scared me just the same. The husband put the dog down in the garage, where it finally stopped howling. I met the little girl, and then the mother put her to bed in her upstairs bedroom. When the couple left, I turned on the TV, despite the hot night. There was not even as much as a fan in the house, yet the house was comfortably cool. At about 10 or 11 p.m. that night, the TV began to have interference and the lights dimmed noticeably. The television began to get so much interference that it became impossible to watch. The lights dimmed even more. I thought that there must be something wrong with electrical wiring in the old house. I sat by the light and began to read. The house was becoming cooler. Despite the hot night outside, this house was becoming cold. There was an afghan on the back of the couch, which I wrapped around me. I went to the window, wondering why it was suddenly becoming cold. The window pane was warm. It was certainly warmer than the house was at the moment. I tried to open the window to let the warm air in, but I could not budge any of the windows. The outside world looked so strange from inside the house, as though you were looking at something far away or looking at a picture of something rather than reality. Then I began to hear what sounded like a light footfall at the top of the stairs. I could only hear them coming down, but not up, on about the top one third of the stairway. I looked to see if this little girl had gotten up, but she was sound asleep with her sheet tucked in around her. As I sat reading, the footfall became closer and got louder. I stood by the stairway and watched. I saw nothing, but could still hear the footfall. I thought that this old house must be still settling to be making all this noise. Then, the footfalls became a pounding and seemed to reach the end of the stairwell. They were closer together, loud and insistent, but always, always, only descending the staircase, never ascending it. Then, I heard a loud bang from the room, directly in line with the stairway at the top. I raced to the room, thinking that I might find a little girl there, or a small animal, which might have gotten into the house, and knocked something over. I turned on the light to the room. The room was very cold, and the light was very dim. The child was not there, and nothing was out of place. I recalled promptly from the small frigid room. The hairs at the back of my neck were standing up, and I felt a strange sensation, as though a current of electricity was coursing through my spine to the base of my skull. I checked on the little girl, who was sound asleep despite the racket, and still tuck her snugly into her bed. At this point, I was getting scared, but figured that there must be some rational explanation for what was happening. The footsteps continued their pounding, but now they descended all the way to the foyer. There was a deep shack carpet runner along the foyer. I could hear creaking floorboards beneath it and indentations in the carpet as though someone were pacing on it. I thought that there must be some really small animal on the carpet and decided to try to catch it. I planted myself in the middle of the carpet 
when something came over me. Everything went dark for a second. I felt as though someone had thrown something over my head, and for a few seconds, I couldn't breathe. This was no small animal. I was petrified. I ran up the stairs to check the child, and she was still fast asleep. After the incident on the carpet, the foothills started making their way up the staircase. It was like a playback of what had been going on most of the night, only in reverse. By the time the foothills reached the top third of the stairwell, they'd stopped the incessant pounding and were only slightly stepping, yet still only descending the stairway. Finally, they disappeared entirely. The lights resumed their brightness, and the television was no longer bothered by the interference. By this time, it was about 2 a.m., and the stairwalking had gone on for several hours. All through this, there had been not one peep from the dog in the garage. The couple returned home about 4 a.m. They asked me if everything had been all right. I had felt as though I had been losing my mind. I just told them that everything had been okay. The next day, my foster sister made a point of asking me, how did the babysitting go? I told her, the house is really weird. Then she told me, I didn't want to tell you before you went babysitting because I didn't want to scare you. She proceeded to tell me that the former owners had told her that the house was haunted. They told her that all the members of the family had seen the ghost many times. They explained that one of the original owners of the house, a Mr. H, had committed suicide by hanging himself from the attic door, which was directly above the top landing of the stairwell. They had taken my sister for a tour of the house. When they had been renovating the house, they had discovered that the house beams and studs had been joined together by wooden pegs and not nails. This was a very old construction technique that was used because making wooden pages was easier than having to make nails. They took my foster sister for a tour of the cellar, which consisted of a maze-like collection of windowless cubicles. In each of the cubicles were manacles for hands and feet. Had Mr. H bought slaves to use as farm workers? In that area, the growing season is short and the winters are long and cold. Buying slaves would hardly have been cost effective for such a short period of time. Long ago, the land there had belonged to the Rampo Indians. Had Mr. H taken these people as seasonal slaves and dispensed with them after harvest time? My friends went down to the town city hall to check the records of the house. The records show that the house was considerably newer than had been thought about mid-19th century. This was after the slavery had been discontinued in the Northeast. The former owners of the house, who were also builders and renovators of old houses, said that the mode of construction that was used in the house would date the house as being much older. I guess we will never know who was kept manacle in those airless little rooms in the cellar. We'll never know why Mr. H was driven to suicide, or if his death was indeed a suicide. Was the ghost that of Mr. H, or of someone else? Perhaps there is more than one tormented spirit in that troubled household. I'm from a very small town in Madison Parish, Louisiana. One cold February night, my five sisters and I were going to visit my dad's brothers, as was a habit of ours to do, a couple of times during the week. My father had a work van in which the motor was encased on the inside of the van. Since it only had a driver's seat and a passenger seat, some of us had to sit on top of the motor case. This night, in particular, we took a different route to our uncle's home for some reason unknown. As we turned onto a side street, only one of my other sisters and I saw a woman with long flowing brown hair down to her waist in a long flowing white nightgown glide across the street about one or two blocks ahead of us. 
My sister and both looked at each other at the same time and said, did you see that? One second she was to our left, and the next she was across the street and then just vanished. When we got home later that night, I told my mother what my sister and I had seen. She said that many, many years ago. I'm not sure if it was in the early 1900s. A young lady who lived in that area was to be married. On her wedding night, her fiancé was tragically killed before the wedding could take place. The bride, who was very much in love with her fiancé, pined away and died from the grief of her loss. My mother said that my sister and I were not the only ones who had seen this lady. I will never forget the apparition that I saw that night, and I truly believe that what I saw was a ghost from the past. I suppose that every kid imagines a monster in a closet, or under the bed at one time or another, and I had in fact began to believe my experience to be the result of a young fertile imagination. You see, my room was located in the basement of my parents' home. Located next to the basement stairs, my closet ran under the stair and had only an open doorway, no door. As I lay trying to sleep at night, I was sure I could discern a pair of glowing red eyes staring at me from the closet doorway. This always filled me with a sense of fear and trepidation. I could never quite make out the body of the apparition, more like having an idea of the shape and size, but never really seeing it. I also had the strange feeling that the apparition indeed wished me ill. Furthermore, there was some force that restricted it to the closet. However, as I said, I had begun to doubt the evidence of my own experience. Until years after I had left the family home, my cousin came to stay with my mom and dad due to family difficulties. She stayed in my former room. Mom informed me that she was having trouble sleeping. However, she could not seem to get her to give any reason as to her apparent insomnia. My mother asked me to talk to her, fearing her difficulties stemmed from the problems in the family. She further believed that being closer in age might make it easier for her to open up. She described to me exactly the same manifestation I had imagined when I slept in that room. After a room change, she was once again able to sleep comfortably at night. My friend Christy is engaged to this guy named Sean. Sean has lived for most of his life at his parents' house in Cincinnati, Ohio. Sean's house is very old and just happens to be in a development that is situated over an old Indian burial ground. For as long as Sean can remember, there has been a ghost in the house. It imitates the voices of people who live in the house. There are many instances of Sean or his sisters being alone in the house and hearing one of their parents begging for help downstairs, only to go to the parent's aid and discover that the parent is not in the house. Sean even recorded it once while he was recording himself playing drums. In addition, there is a spirit that follows them and visitors around the house. It is a tall dark figure wearing a hooded cloak. It has never harmed anyone, but merely made them feel uncomfortable. About a year ago, Christy made a trip out to Cincinnati to meet Sean's parents for the first time. He didn't want to tell her about the house because he didn't want to spook her. Sean's parents invited her to stay in the guest room and Christy accepted. The first night of the visit, Christy was sound asleep when she woke up suddenly and felt something icy slide over her and felt like something was watching her. She got spooked and went over to Sean's room and slid into bed with him and stayed there for the rest of the night. Sean didn't tell her at the time, 
but the hooded figure followed her into the room. The same thing happened the next night, and Sean finally told her. She refused to stay in the house another night. When I was about four or five, maybe even younger, I remember one night I was sleeping in my room and I awoke. I don't know why I did. I may have been dreaming. Anyways, I looked ahead of me to my wall and there was a face on it. It was blue, looked human, and this may sound strange, but I had a hat on that looked like one of those Arabian towels that they wrapped their heads with. It spoke to me. I don't remember what it said, but oddly, I wasn't afraid of it. I don't remember the reaction, but I asked my mom if she remembered about when I told her there recently, and she said I used to tell her about a lady in blue visiting me quite often. I only remember telling her about my only experience once. I might have seen the face more than I remember. I don't think it was a dream. Because I don't think I would remember a dream I had when I was 5 or younger. I'm 15 now, so it was at least 10 or more years ago. That's my experience. If anyone has had an experience similar to mine, please write me about it. I've only had one paranormal experience. It happened last October when my boyfriend had temporarily rented a trailer. We had lived there for almost two months and nothing out of the ordinary had happened. One afternoon, he decided to take a nap and I was in the living room watching TV. I started hearing this really strange continuous screeching noise. It sounded like it was coming from inside the wall beside his bedroom door. When I walked over there, it stopped I sat back down and started watching TV again, and it started back again. This time, I walked into the kitchen. The bedroom was right beside the kitchen, and I started opening the bottom cabinets, and once again, the screeching stopped. I never said anything about it to my boyfriend, because I didn't think about it at the time. A couple of days later, we were in the kitchen eating breakfast, and he told me that the day before, when he was there by himself, that he had heard a weird, loud, screeching noise. He said he tried to find where it was coming from, and it would stop when he'd look. I told him that the same thing had happened to me while he was asleep a few days earlier. We both talked about ghosts and laughed about it, pretty much dismissing it as a joke. A few nights later, his mom came and stayed the whole night and was asleep on the living room couch. This particular night, we were sleeping in the bedroom on the opposite end of the trailer. It was really late, probably around 3 a.m., and we had been laying there talking when I started hearing this noise. It was kind of like the screeching, but much quieter and screeched in intervals like footsteps. I thought my boyfriend had dropped over the side of the bed, making that noise with his hand against the plastic on the mattress. I said, Brian, quit making that noise. He said, I'm not making that noise, and held up both of his hands. He looked at me as scared as I looked back at him, and he said, get up and get dressed. As soon as he said that, you could actually tell where the screeching was moving through the room to the corner beside the bed and feel this undiscernible presence and all of a sudden the screeching just went crazy and so loud it was right there needless to say within a split second it was the only one there now you can imagine two grown adults running into the living room to wake up his mom she said she hadn't heard anything but that we had scared her to death running through the living room at 3 a.m. in the morning like we were on fire. We sat up in the living room for the rest of the night and moved back to my mom's house within the week. So far, that's the only experience that I've had.
I'm glad you reached the end of the video. And as Phantom of Darkness always likes to say, I'm talking to myself in the third person. Anyway, uh, guys, thank you so much for actually watching the video and supporting the channel and helping me reach 22,000 subscribers. I'm a little under the weather. Actually, it's more than a little bit under the weather. I have actually an infection in my tooth, so I'm not doing very well, but I'm on antibiotics and... Um, uh, as you guys are waiting for the newest recorded release, uh, you guys get a compilation of some of the best stories that I've done in the past month. So hopefully that's not a big deal for you guys. And I encourage you to like, share, and subscribe this video and really enjoy the October that you have left. Um, if you're coming across this video after October, thank you so much for joining and I hope that you stick around and subscribe. So guys, I love you very much and I'll see you in the next video.